Hey guys, welcome back to Young Americans Abroad, your best place for weekly content on young American soccer players playing overseas. My name's Austin Van Churn, and again, I'll be by myself today. But as always, welcome to our show. So guys, we have a really interesting show for you guys today. So we had a lot of good performances from our players midweek. However, we had a few bad performances over the weekend, or I guess not really uh, difference-making performances over the weekend. So we'll get to all that. We also have a roster reaction that we want to get to you guys. And then finally, we'll end with uh, you know our quick kick segment, as always. So as always, let's get into our episode. So the first player who really epitomizes that good performance midweek, not so good performance uh, over the weekend, would be Christian Pulisic. So Christian Pulisic played really well for Dortmund in their 7-0 win over FC Nuremberg midweek, where he actually had the game opening assist uh, for Dortmund. And it was a really nice uh, play where he actually got by a defender and then dribbled up through the midfield, had a nice lofted kind of through ball, I guess you would say, to uh, Jakob Bruin Larsen who then finished on a, a volley right over the goalkeeper's head to uh, to make it 1-0 for Dortmund. And then Dortmund went on to score, you know, six more goals throughout the game. Um, but, yeah, it was a really, really fun performance from Christian. Um, there was a all-touches video that went around, I believe, on Reddit, and it really just showcased, you know, how dominant Pulisic was on the day. And he was really, you know, Dortmund's creator – in terms of just taking on players and in one-on-one situations and getting the ball in the box into the box for for players to you know get onto the you know get chances from or create chances from and and it was really the player that that kind of made Dortmund tick on the day so that was you know really exciting to see and I guess it's worth noting that you know Nuremberg I believe it, on that day was bottom of the table so definitely some weaker opposition that Dortmund was going up against. And that was kind of telling um, when they went into their match over the weekend against uh, Bayer Leverkusen. So Dortmund actually ended up winning that game against Leverkusen 4-2. to two, But they had to come back kind of heroically because they were down at one point uh, 2-0 to, uh, to Leverkusen. And Christian Pulisic didn't have a very good day. He, he did a lot of the same things he did in that Nuremberg game. But just unfortunately, you know, the, the times where he kept taking on players in, in one-on-one and two-on-one situations, uh, he just he wasn't able to get by people during the day and, and kept losing possession and actually had some of his teammates get frustrated with him throughout the day. Um, and he also just wasn't getting any calls. Um, you know, he was getting fouled a lot in this Leverkusen game. And unfortunately, you know, the officials just didn't see them as fouls. So, um, yeah, that kind of got to him as well. But that that bad for excuse me that bad performance was actually kind of heightened when Jaden Sancho came on the pitch and you know minutes on to, after uh, coming on the pitch he actually got Dortmund's game tying assist and then went on to get another assist in stoppage time for Dortmund on their fourth goal so while you know Christian Pulisic struggled on the day to create and you know kind of do Christian Pulisic things in terms of just dribbling by players and, and getting into dangerous areas and kind of being a provider a catalyst in the middle for Dortmund, um, or I guess on the wing, he's, he doesn't play in the middle for Dortmund, but um, yeah, it was kind of just that difference was kind of heightened or that contrast was heightened since Sancho came on and played really, really well. And Sancho played so well that he was actually named man of the match day for the entire Bundesliga. And that was just in a 22 minute uh, performance. So, you know, I guess that kind of adds uh, insult to injury for for Christian in terms of you know his his bad performance on the day, and people were were talking all over Twitter about Sancho since at the moment he's now the assists leader in all of Europe with five assists. So I don't think we'll see um, you know Jaden Sancho take Christian Pulisic's starting spot yet, but I think Christian Pulisic is kind of on the hot seat at the moment, um, which I think is good to be honest because. It's always good to be pushed as a player um, and, you know, know that someone's right behind you looking to take your place. And that's honestly what Sancho is doing at the moment uh, to Pulisic. So I don't think it's a situation that, you know, we have to be too worried about yet. However, you know, it just, you know, forces Pulisic to now, uh, you know, work a little harder and, um, 
you know, try to play a little better each game. Like he's not already, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, that was Christian Pulisic's eventful week. And uh, now we want to move over to England and talk a little bit about Luca De La Torre, who had a fantastic midweek performance um, in the EFL Cup for Fulham. And Fulham actually won this game 3-1. And Luca De La Torre actually had a hand in all of Fulham's three goals. So the first goal came off a Luca De La Torre assist where he just, you know, received the ball um, kind of in the midfield you know, center of the park midfield, and then, uh, you know, turned, took a few dribbles, and then played this really, really nice uh, curved through ball, I would say, to uh, to the winger who came in and then took a nice shot, you know, on the ground and finished, you know, right across the, the goalkeeper and into that, uh, like, bottom front corner of the goal. It was a really beautiful goal, and it really showcased something that I haven't seen from Luca yet, and that's kind of his... Um, like his silky smooth kind of uh, like, I don't know, his touch, his silky smooth touch. I, I kind of recognize or have Luca De La Torre pinned in my head as that player who's, you know, really good on the ball, has good technique, is kind of conservative in the way he plays and doesn't really try to, you know, force the issue in terms of playing passes ahead and, and trying to, you know, play through balls into, you know, attackers going forward and, and trying to beat the defense that way. He's more of a possession-based player who tries to, you know, just pass it around and, and take some one-twos from here, uh, you know, from time to time. But, uh, yeah, that wasn't the case at all in this game. Uh, Luca De La Torre really uh, was just aggressive in terms of what he tried to do in this game. And and this assist was a perfect example of that and, and showcased, obviously, that technique, but also – you know, his willingness to to kind of try things. And he, he really needed to uh, get that pass timed perfectly or at least release that pass at the perfect time because the defender was closing in on him, uh, you know, right when he released that ball. So it was really cool to see uh, that play. And then also later in the game, his, his goal was really nice as well. So he received the ball um, just in the box and took a first touch perfectly to set him up for his shot. And again, he got that shot off really, really quick which he needed to do because the defender was closing down on him. And, you know, in order to score that goal, he kind of had to have that, that, you know, self-awareness and also kind of the, I mean, it wasn't a, like I said, like kind of, he, he doesn't really like to take risks. And I believe at this situation, he kind of just needed to, to play off of, you know, inclination and, and, uh, you know, just the feeling of, when to take that shot. It wasn't something that he could wait for to feel comfortable taking that shot. He kind of needed to, to push the envelope and get that shot off quicker than, than uh, you know, he would feel comfortable with. And, and he did that. And look what happened. He scored a goal. So, uh, yeah, so great play from Luca De La Torre in this game. Um, two assists on the day and one goal. Um, and also he got, you know, great pra praise from his manager after this game who said, that, you know, Luca works really hard in training, you know, keeps his head down, doesn't complain about the lack of playing time. And, you know, it's just a fantastic team player. And, you know, that's what we've heard from Luca ever since he was at Fulham. And, you know, it's, I guess, paying dividends for him, you know, since he, he made his, uh, you know, season debut for Fulham, um, you know, over the, during the week, obviously. But, um, you know, his manager also said that he's also in his plans uh, potentially for the Premier League uh, this year. But he said, you know, nothing's, you know, guaranteed. We'll see or he'll see, I guess, where Luca falls into the plans for the rest of the year in terms of, you know, how well Fulham perform in the Premier League and, you know, what they're willing to do in terms of that. Um, you know, they can't really play them if they get into relegation trouble unless, you know, some of the players that they have just really don't perform well. But I kind of don't foresee that happening. So my guess would be that we'll probably see Luca play um, in their next EFL Cup game, unless they get drawn against some you know crazy hard opponent, um, some Premier League opponent. But you know maybe he he still starts because he had such a good game. But um, yeah, that's that's really really fun to see from from Luca, and we're we're very proud of that performance. But uh, yeah, and we'll always monitor. Um, his performance is well going on through the year. So, you know, if he ever does start his uh, or, you know, gets that Premier League debut, we'll be the first to tell you guys. So now we want to go over to Denmark and talk about Jonathan Amon, who had a really, really good week for 
on multiple different levels. So during the midweek uh, in their Danish uh, cup match, uh, FC Nordsjælland, that is, their Danish cup match, Jonathan actually scored uh, one of their goals in their 4-0 win. And then he followed up that performance on Monday with a really, really good performance for Nordsjælland in the league where they won 4-0 over a team I'm not even going to try to pronounce because <laughs> I could not, you know, understand how to uh, use that. Uh, they had like a, a, an O with the slash in it. I'm not really sure how you pronounce that. So, like I said, I'm not even going to give it a try. But, uh, yeah, it was a, a good win for Norchiland, and Jonathan looked very dangerous all game. And there was actually a really good highlight video that I posted on my uh, Twitter account Um at Boone American, so if you want to check that out, go uh, go check me out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and check out that uh, that video because it really showed uh, you know how confident Jonathan is playing at the moment, and he's definitely the focal point, or at least one of the focal points of Nordschland's attack. They just look to get him the ball anytime they break on a counter, and um, you know are just going down the field. It seems like he's always the outlet that um, their players are always looking for. So. It was really, really good to see um, in these highlights just, you know, everything we've seen from Jonathan all year, his speed, um, his willingness to kind of play dangerously or, or take risks. You know, we just talked about Luca De La Torre kind of being con more conservative. I feel like Jonathan Amon is kind of the opposite of that, and he's always trying to, to take on players and, and um, you know, just look to, to be a, a difference maker, um, you know, going forward in the attack. And, and that was showcased in this game. Um, and, you know, we're going to show hopefully some of these highlights throughout this video um, or this segment or this portion of this segment. Um, so you guys will get to see that right away. But, uh, yeah, it was just a great game from Jonathan. I was really impressed with what I saw. And he actually followed that up, or I guess – Dave Sarakin followed that up with naming uh, Jonathan to the U.S. men's national team roster that is set to face uh, Peru and Colombia. So obviously really happy to see Jonathan on this roster, and we'll, we'll maybe touch on this a little bit later in our episode, but I kind of want to touch on it now. Um, but I was, I was so excited to see Jonathan on this roster. I, I think he's definitely deserved this position um, or this spot, I should say, um, just from his play this year and then also his play – to end last year and you know like we've talked about in previous episodes he's just a different player than any of the other players we have in this pool and I think you know we're always looking to to find the next winger um or you know just <laughs> any wingers at this point who are difference makers and I believe Jonathan Amon has all the abilities to be that difference maker even now in a professional um you know full senior team game um, so hopefully we'll get to see him on the pitch. Obviously, you know, nothing's guaranteed. There's, there's no guarantee he'll play in any of these two games, but I have a strong feeling he will. And, um, you know, we'll get to see more of him up close and, and in person. And maybe we'll see, uh, you know, a video, uh, from, uh, the US MNT, uh, Twitter account, you know, kind of profiling him or something. Uh, I'd love to see more, you know, about him and his personal life and, you know, his, uh, his rise, I guess, at North Chile. And he's kind of, uh, it's kind of unknown, obviously he came from, from South Carolina and went over at an early age to, uh, their academy there. But, you know, it'd be, I, I'm just more interested to, to, you know, see more of him and then know more about him. So I feel like I'm not alone, um, in that crowd either, but, uh, yeah, great week from Jonathan, and we're really excited for what the future brings and, and definitely the near future, what uh, these next two friendlies bring um, for the red, white, and blue. So, yeah, now uh, finally let's go to or go back to Germany and talk real quickly about Weston McKinney, who actually came back very quickly from injury. So last week we were very concerned about, you know, Weston's injury and him getting carted off with a, a deep – bone bruise, which is what it was diagnosed as. And we thought, you know, he'd be out for at least one to two weeks, or at least that's what the initial report said. But Weston was back in training really quick and came on and played, uh, I believe it was 28 minutes uh, for, for Schalke um, in this game. Uh, and they actually got their first win of the season um, against Mines, and it was a 1-0 win. And Weston was actually the first substitute who came on. So that was really, you know, encouraging to see. Um, just that, again, Domenico Tedesco really, really trusts uh, Weston to come on and do a job for him. And, you know, that's, that's high praise in my opinion. Um, 
you know, especially since Schalke aren't in the best position in the Bundesliga table at the moment. Um, it was really good to see that Tedesco trusts him enough to bring him on to kind of secure the game for Schalke um, and was that first person that Tedesco called upon. So, um, yeah, didn't play great in this game. Um, you know, again, he came on to just preserve the the lead and, and you know, lock down Schalke's defense. So I don't think, you know, some of the, the highlights that uh, – uh, who was it scuffed on uh, Twitter uh, tweeted out some of the gifs that he tweeted out uh, showed Weston losing possession and not making the best um, plays, but you know, there was only a few different plays that he, he kind of showed of that or, or, you know, that Weston had during the game that he showed. Um, so I don't think it's that big of a deal that he didn't play great in this game um, or, you know, didn't play outstanding, I should say. Um, but yeah, it was. It's good to see Schalke actually get their first win of the Bundesliga season, and you know it's good to see Weston play a part of that. And it's also good to see Weston back for Schalke and not uh, injured. And you know that's also good for us as well because now he's in this U.S. Men's National Team camp, so we'll we'll get to see some more of Weston in the in the near future. But that's it for for our segment, uh, our first segment this week. A little bit of a shorter segment. But now we want to go over and talk about the U.S. Men's National Team roster that was just announced. So now I want to talk a little bit about the uh, U.S. Men's National Team roster that was just released for their upcoming games against Peru and Colombia. And it was a very interesting roster that mixed youth and experience. And a lot of people had, you know, a lot of opinions on Twitter and Reddit and uh, you know, even Instagram. There was a lot of uh, outrage for some of the things or you know, some of the people that were on this roster, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But I just wanted to start off with a few positives. So the first positive I touched on a little earlier in the episode, and that is uh, we're really happy to see Jonathan Amone in this camp. I think it's it's long overdue, uh, maybe not long overdue, but I think he needed to be in one of these camps this fall just so that we can get a better look at him. Um, we as in, I guess, the coaching staff and, and also, you know, obviously us fans, I'd love to get, you know, a better look at Jonathan and, and see what type of player he is kind of firsthand. Um, but I think he's a player that needs to be integrated into this young core. And, he, you know, he's only 19 years old, so he's older than uh, Tim Weah, but he's also the same age as, you know, Tyler Adams. I guess he's younger now since Weston McKinney and uh, Christian Plissick just had birthdays. But he's still, you know, at that age that all these players um, of these this core that we have now coming together are. So I think, you know, it's really impre- or really exciting to see Jonathan in this camp, and I hope we get to see him play at least – some minutes in, in any of these games or any of these two games coming up. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy, and, and I was happy to see, you know, Jonathan on this, this roster when it was first announced. But uh, going on to another positive from this midfield group, and that would be I'm so happy to see, you know, Christian Pulisic, West McKinney, Tyler Adams, and, and Tim Weah all together again. Um, you know, the last time we saw them on the same pitch or, you know, in the same camp, was against that, uh, or uh, for the U.S. men's national team against Bolivia. And that was, you know, obviously a game against a weaker opponent, but it was a really fun game uh, to watch. You know, me and Pat were in attendance there. And it was a game that just got me really excited because you could see, you know, all the qualities that these players have from playing abroad. And, and just, you know, they're aggressive players. They're players who are willing to take risks they're players who are constantly trying to, you know, improve their games and and not be kind of complacent. They really want to prove that, you know, the U.S. is an upcoming, you know, I guess world power, you want to say. That might be a little too uh, strong of a statement, but I guess they're an upcoming nation, you know, in, in the soccer world. And I think, you know, all four – I guess I mentioned four players, um, Pulisic, McKinney, Adams, and Weah. All four of those players are, you know, very outspoken in their support and love for the men's national team and, and the USA, obviously. So I'm just really excited to see them all in a camp together and really excited to see them play, uh, you know, against good opponents in Peru and Colombia. I think, you know, they're going to be, you know, very up for both of, both of these games and, I hope we get to see them all on the field at the same time, to be honest. So, yeah, that was another positive from the midfield. My final positive from the midfield was uh, 
Kenny Saif. So Kenny Saif hasn't been in a camp since I believe the Gold Cup. And actually, I feel like he's been in a camp since then. So I'm sorry if I'm wrong on that. But Kenny Saif coming back to the men's national team, um, I'm all for it. I think he's a very uh, technical player. I think he's a player who definitely has a future with this team. He's a player that plays for, you know, a Champions League club um, in Anderlecht and has, you know, shown last year especially that he's a player who can make a difference whenever he's on the pitch. So I'm really excited to see Kenny uh, back in action for the red, white, and blue. And, uh, yeah, I hope he, he gets some playing time in these games coming up. I think he's a player that is different than a lot of players in our pool. He's not – kind of that dynamic winger like we talked about with uh, Jonathan Amon, but he's a player that, you know, can create and, you know, is just a hard worker on the outside. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm all for someone who, uh, you know, is that type of player, to be honest with you. I, I just think he, he brings so many good technical qualities to the game and um, – or to the team, I should say. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see Kenny back – back in action for the uh, the men's national team. Now going over to defense, and we'll show the defenders on the screen, uh, my biggest takeaway from this, uh, this list right here is Reggie Cannon. So Reggie's had a really good year from FC Dallas, and it's not been so much him going forward that he's been very, you know, people have been really excited about. It's actually been his defensive play. So I'm really excited to see, and I hope he gets a chance to play. Obviously, DeAndre Yedlin has been called up as well. So I feel DeAndre might get the nod in at least one of these two games. But I'm really excited to see what Reggie can bring to the field defensively. Um, you know, he's also quick and he can get forward. But I'm, I've heard a lot about his defensive um, game so far this season. I've watched a few FC Dallas games, and I've seen he's, you know, very good and reacts well to, to the game and, you know, identifies situations well. And, and wins a lot of one-on-one -on -one battles. But I want to see him go up against, you know, both of these teams or at least one of the teams, you know what I mean? Um, you know, whenever he gets in the game, I want to see what he can do um, locking down some of these dynamic players that, you know, play on Colombia, um, players, you know, such as James Rodriguez, Juan Cuadrado, um, and then also some players on uh, Peru who are very dynamic themselves. So I'm, I'm really excited to see Reggie Cannon. And the other takeaway I had from this group of defenders is we get to see the Matt Miazga and John Brooks partnership again. So anytime that we get to see these two play together, um, I'm all for. Um, I think, you know, these are obviously our two best central defenders. And I think, you know, the more time they get on the pitch together, the, the better understanding they'll have with each other, the more confident they'll be, um, you know, playing with each other. And I'm really excited to see, you know, what they can provide on um, set plays because both are really good at heading the ball. And, um, you know, also a another underrated quality of both of their games is how well they are passing out of the back. So obviously it's been uh, a little bit more documented uh, with Matt Miazga recently after the, uh, the Mexico game and even the Brazil game. There were some highlights going around of his his passes from the back and, you know, passes that split defenders and, you know, split certain, um, I guess, levels of the field um, or levels of defenders on the field. Um, but John Brooks can do that just as well as Matt Miazga, if not even a little better, in my opinion. So just having two center backs who are, you know, strong, dominant in the air and also can pass, um, you know, that's 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 crazy, in my opinion, I think. You know, this is the first time we've had that in, in a very long time. And, you know, both are still relatively relatively young. John Anthony Brooks is 25 years old at the moment, and Matt Miazga, I believe, is 23 still. So I think, you know, this will be the pairing for, for a long time to come, at least the next five to six years, unless something, you know, unforeseen happens. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to see these two uh, back in our camp. And finally, just going over to strikers real quick, I want to give, I guess, a shout out to the two that we talk on our show or talk about on our show the most, and that would be Josh Sargent and Andrea Novakovic. So I'm really happy to see both of these guys back in camp. You know, Josh missed the last camp, and I, you know, was all for him missing that last camp to get, you know, a shot with the first team, although it doesn't seem like really anything came of it since then. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to see him back playing for the, the senior men's national team. And I hope he gets, you know, a game here, um, 
you know, over these two games. I got to believe that Bobby Wood will start one of these games just since he's been doing that, you know, the past few friendlies that, uh, you know, the U.S. men's national team has had. But I really hope that, you know, Sarah can just rolls the dice and kind of throws Josh into the fire a little bit and, uh, you know, isn't conservative with them. I think if we could see, you know, Josh on the field with Tim Weah, with Christian Pulisic, with Tyler Adams, with Weston McKinney, similar to, I guess, what we saw um, against Bolivia. And also, you know, add in Jonathan Amon now. Um, not sure how you would pair all those guys together on the field. But, uh, you know, if, if we could do that in one of these games, at least for a period of time, I would be really excited. And I think, you know, a lot of other people would be as well. But, um, yeah, so happy to see Josh. So happy to see Andrea as well, who played really well over the weekend, in my opinion, um, against a really good team in Ajax. And obviously, you know, Sittard was the weaker team in this this matchup over the weekend. So Andrea wasn't always on the ball. But when he was and, uh, you know, when Sittard had the ball, uh, Andrea was always, you know, getting into really good positions, um, always calling for the ball as well. So he was very active. And then when, when he had the ball, um, he just – he was really good with it, to be honest with you. He had a really nice play where he kind of received a, a long pass, had to hold off a defender just to get onto the ball, and then, um, you know, held off the defender when he got up to the ball and then, you know, kept his head up, played a really nice weighted pass to, um, to a player that was kind of running into the box all alone and, and took an uncontested shot. But that pass was weighted perfectly. And, um, you know, it was really cool to see. That was one of those plays um, throughout that that uh, Sitar Ajax game. There was a few plays that really stood, stood out to me from, from Andrea. But that play was just like, whoa, like Andrea is really starting to get it together, um, you know, playing for, for Sitar and playing in the air Divisi. That was a really incredible play, in my opinion, when I watched it real in, uh, you know, real time. I, I was really taken aback by that play. But um, yeah, so I hope you know Andrea hasn't has been called up to the last two U.S. men's national team camps, but hasn't featured for uh, you know the USA in either of those camps. So I'm hoping you know finally he can play, um, <coughs> excuse me, or at least get minutes in um, either of these games for the men's national team. I think uh, you know we need to see more of him. Obviously, there's a, probably a reason why he hasn't played. Whether it's just Sarkin just doesn't trust him or doesn't see. Um, him being, or I, I guess it would just be him not being comfortable to put him in against the, the teams that they played. Obviously, Brazil was a tough, tough game, and I could see why they wouldn't play him against Brazil. Um, Mexico, you know, is a different animal as well. But honestly, at this point, why not just throw some of these these guys in the fire and see what they have? If they, you know, perform really, really, really well, then maybe, um, you know, it just you know builds upon itself, kind of, kind of like what happened with Bobby Wood to uh, when he broke out with the men's national team, um, where he played really well against the Netherlands, scored that late goal, and then also scored that late goal against Germany, um, you know, way back when I think it was like 2015. So um, I'm really you know in favor of seeing Andrea play in these two games um, in some capacity, but you know time will tell if that happens. But uh, yeah, so that's. That's all the positives, I would say, from uh, this roster release. Now let's go over to a little bit of the, uh, the negative side of this roster, or at least the negative side in my opinion. And the negative side would kind of hinge on these two experienced players that were called up for, uh, for Dave Sarakin's team here. And that was obviously Michael Bradley and Brad Kuzan. So let's start, I guess, on Michael Bradley a little bit. And obviously... I don't know, I guess, how well documented it is of how much of a fan or not a fan of Michael Bradley I've been, um, you know, over the over the years and over obviously the last year and a half. Um, I think, you know, Michael Bradley, I would have been fine with him not being on this roster, to be completely honest. Um, I'm just I really hope that, you know, his inclusion in this team and, and his presence in this camp doesn't overshadow kind of the the youth and the the core that is, you know, slowly starting to form um, with this new men's national team. I, uh, you know, I think if he does have a, a role to play on this team, I think he's got to be a guy that comes in with the attitude of I'm here to help the younger guys uh, grow and, you know, help them on their journey. Not so much him coming in and being, 
you know, I'm here because I was the previous captain and, you know, I'm the person who, you know, I got to show in this camp that I still am the focal point of the men's national team. And I'm, you know, just as talented and can start and be just as effective as all these other young guys. I don't think that should be the, you know, the way he comes into this camp and approaches it. I think he needs to approach it more towards that first uh, statement that I was saying, where he needs to just come in and, and realize that, you know, Things have changed a little bit since he was back in the uh, the men's national team, and he kind of just needs to be kind of a father figure to some of these younger players and and show them, you know, how things have happened in the past when, you know, he's experienced success in his career because he has experienced, um, you know, a lot of success playing for the red, white, and blue. And, you know, I'm, I don't want to discredit that because he's done some really good things um, for the men's national team. But at the same point in time, he's got to realize that, you know, this team's not revolving around him anymore. And I hope he's not the captain for any of these games, to be completely honest, um, just because I don't think it would be right for someone to not be in a camp for, you know, over a year. Or I guess it would be just under a year. Um, so I hope that doesn't happen. But, you know, someone made the point to me on Twitter because I, you know, tweeted out a few things about my thoughts on Michael Bradley being on the uh, – on the roster. And, you know, I was saying, you know, exactly what I'm saying right now. I think he needs to be that, that father figure. And someone was saying, well, why not him be the captain then of the team? And, you know, to that, I think that's, you know, an interesting point that, you know, he would be doing captainly things if he's the father figure of the team. But, um, you know, I think he's got to, got to show that he can't just become a captain this first camp or, become a captain again in this first camp. If, if he does take on that father figure role and kind of takes a backseat to the success that the U.S. men's national team um, does have, then, you know, maybe he is a good option to be a captain. Um, but we'll see. Um, you know, the other thing is it'll be weird to see um, if he's not the captain, Michael Bradley at a camp where the captain's definitely younger than him, you would have to think, unless Brad Guzan gets uh, appointed the captain. So that'll be an interesting dynamic, whichever, you know, whatever happens. And again, I, I don't know if he should start. I'm not even going to get into that side of the things um, or that side of things. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to leave that up to you guys to uh, decide in the comments or also on Twitter or Instagram, um, you know, follow us there and uh, let us know if, you know, if you think Michael Bradley should play a part in any of these two games, um, obviously he's called up, but that doesn't mean he'll play. So we'll see. But um, now we want to finish with the goalkeepers. And my one negative, again, was that experience. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of Brad Guzan being in this camp. And I'll tell you why. And it's not so much Brad Guzan as it is just the fact that we have an experienced goalkeeper um, kind of coming into this crop of goalkeepers that we've been calling up recently. Um, so obviously, I don't think Brad Guzan's really an issue on this team um, in the way that Michael Bradley could become an issue on the team. Um, and I, I think Brad Guzan is talented enough to be in this this group of goalkeepers and maybe play a role for us based on talent alone. But with that being said, I just I don't see how beneficial or how it would be beneficial to bring in an experienced goalkeeper like this to um, provide competition for someone like Zach Steffen. So obviously, you know, we want competition within our goalkeeping core and we want, you know, Zach Steffen to be tested game in and game out and not feel like, you know, this starting goalkeeping position is his own and no one can, you know, challenge him for it. But at the same point, if Zach Steffen does falter and has a few mistakes and doesn't look good in a few games, how is it going to be going forward if we throw in Brad Guzan and then Brad Guzan plays, you know, pretty well or well enough to suggest that maybe it's his goalkeeping position for the near future? Um, I just don't understand what's that going to do for us going forward. Um, I'd ra much rather see Zach Steffen work out his, his kinks and work through some of his issues, you know, that he still has in his game on the field for the men's national team, rather than seeing, you know, him get benched and then maybe lose confidence or be put in a tough situation to come back from, um, you know, going forward with the men's national team. I just, I'm a little timid over that situation that could arise if, if Zach Steffen does falter. So that's kind of the reason why I'm not so happy to see Brad Guzan on this roster. But at the same point in time, you know, he's played pretty well during the MLS season so far. So I'm not totally um, against seeing him on this team. I'm just a little timid. So that those are my um, 
you know, my reactions to the roster. And like I said, guys, reach out to us on Twitter, on Instagram, and in the comments. Let us know what you think about this roster and what players you're excited to see. Also, what players you're not excited to see. And, uh, you know, tell us what players you wish were on the roster. We didn't even really get to that in this segment. But, um, yeah, we can, you know, we'll always uh, debate that in the comments. So uh, now let's move over to Quick Kicks. All right, guys. It's that time of the week again. It's time for Quick Kicks. Let's see you could test Dwayne Miller. It's Altador over the wall. All right, guys, so to start off quick kicks today, we want to let you guys know that Sebastian Soto scored a very important goal for Hanover 96's U19s in their 2-0 win over FC St. Pauli's U19s. So this goal was really important because FC St. Pauli was actually top of the Nord region for the U19 division, um, and it was a really nice goal from Sebastian off a really – uh, nice volley, so really cool to see from Sebastian. And again, he just keeps scoring in Germany. Now we want to stay in Germany and talk a little bit about Zian Jones, who actually started for Schalke's U19s over the weekend and scored his very first goal for them in their 2-1 win over Dusseldorf's U19s. So now we want to go over to Spain and touch on uh, Mikwele Akale, who actually scored three goals in two games this week for uh, Villarreal B. And that was really cool to see uh, from Mikwele. There were really nice goals, and it's good to see him playing well. Now we want to go over to England and talk a little bit about Indiana Vasilev, who scored his first goal for Aston Villa's U18s this weekend in their 1-1 draw with Sunderland's U18s. Now we want to go over to France and talk a little bit about Nick Giacchini, who's a player we touched on at multiple points so far this season and was one of our young yas in uh, our very first episode of the season. And he's off to a really good start in France, actually has seven goals in six games from for Cannes U19s and is actually trained with the first team for uh, short periods of time. So, uh, you know, that's really good from uh, Nick. And again, we'll keep monitoring his progress there at Cannes. Now we want to go over to Germany again and let you guys know that Bobby Wood actually played the entire second half for Hanover this weekend and actually had an assist for uh, Hanover in their unfortunate three-run loss. Then we want to stay in Germany yet again and talk a little bit about Josh Sargent, who actually scored another goal for uh, Werder Bremen's U23s this weekend over Hanover 96's uh, second team. However, uh, Werder Bremen's U23s actually lost that game 3-1. So not good, but good for Josh. Now we want to go back over to France and talk about Matt Miazga, let you guys know they played 90 minutes uh, in Nantes' 1-1 draw with Lyon, a very good opponent. And finally, we want to end this episode with another young yaw, and the young yaw this week is Jordan Adebayo-Smith, who actually plays for Lincoln City, uh, or at least their, their U18 team. And Lincoln City is a team in England in the English uh, League 2, which is, I guess, the fourth tier of, uh, you know, England's uh, football league. Um, but, yeah, so Jordan is a 16-year-old uh, a striker, and, again, he plays for their U18 team, and he actually scored a goal this weekend, um, which brings his tally to four on the season. So good to see from Jordan, and it is worth noting that Jordan's also a uh, triple national, so he can play for England, Nigeria, or the U.S. So uh, we'll have to keep monitoring him and see, you know, what his career holds for him, and if he's a player that, uh, you know, we'll uh, be seeing more of in the future. And as always, guys, thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video and subscribe to our channel. And also, don't forget to leave a comment. Again, let us know what you think about the uh, U.S. men's national team roster, and let us know if there's any players that we didn't touch in today's episode. I know we got some comments uh, about Keaton Parks in the uh last comment section of our last video. And, uh, you know, we're always monitoring Keaton, but unfortunately we don't really have any uh, new information to report at the time. But like I said, you know, let us know if there's any other players you want to see. And uh, also follow us on social media, follow our Instagram account, and also follow our uh, Twitter account. We recently just reached uh, 1,500 followers. So uh, thanks, guys. We really appreciate all the support. And uh, again, as always, there's only one way to end this episode. And that would be one day we will win the World Cup.